Hello and welcome. My name is Monika Griefan. I'm the chairperson of the eFuel Alliance, and together with the Maritime Platform, we organize today this webinar. At first, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all panelists and participants in the name of the Maritime Platform and the eFuel Alliance. We are especially happy that we can welcome such an interesting panel with voices from politics, industry, and non-governmental organizations. Today, we want to draw the attention to one of the most vital sectors of the EU, shipping. Shipping is of great importance to the European economy and its prosperity, while at the same time being under global competition. This, of course, makes the task of defossilization this factor even more challenging. It is, however, already clear that synthetic climate neutral fuels, such as e-fuels, will play a decisive role in making sh shipping sustainable. On a European level, uh, the fuel EU maritime regulation will decide to which extent e-fuels will be supported in the maritime sector. While the European Commission and the Council did not specifically include e-fuels, just this Monday, the Transport Committee of the European Parliament adopted a subquota of e-fuels of 2% in 2030. The position of the European Parliament is clear. When the plenary will be vote on this regulation in two weeks, there will be a subquota on e-fuels. This brings up many questions which, want, uh, we, which we want to address today. How ambitious can and should such a subquota be? How would such a quota affect the shipping industry and prices for end consumers? What technical developments and regulatory framework are necessary to enable a sustainable, global, competitive maritime sector. With these questions, I will hand over to our moderator for today, Ralf Diemer, Managing Director of the eFuel Alliance. He will bring us through the day, and I wish you very interesting thoughts and insights. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monika. Um, fortunately, it's not a whole day I have to bring you through. Um, uh, just the next two hours, um, but uh, also from my side, a warm welcome to uh, to all of you. We are very happy uh, to have you uh, on to our today's event uh, on maritime uh, subjects, especially uh, the decarbonization of the maritime sector is our subject today. Um, we have a very distinguished panel, uh, and we are very happy about that because there is a lot of competence uh, today uh, here in our call. Um, uh, but we would like to start with uh, uh, two members of the European Parliament, actually, because, um, as Monica already pointed out, um, the Parliament and also the European Council are in the process of decision making uh, right now. Uh, and uh, we are very happy that we have two of the shadow rapporteurs uh, in the uh, uh, Committee for Transport uh, uh, now in our call, of course. Um, uh, MEPs are very busy. Um, they have a lot of meetings right now during the uh, session weeks they are having. Uh, therefore, we recorded their um, uh, positions uh, and their messages uh, right before this uh, call. And um, we would like to start with Mrs. Vera Tax. Uh, she is um, a member of the European Parliament since 2019. Um, uh, she's a member of the Socialist and Democrat group in the European Parliament coming from the Netherlands, and she's actually a member of the Transport and Tourism Committee, in short, uh, the so-called TRAN, uh, and in that capacity also the S&D Shadow Rapporteur on the Fuel in Maritime uh, Regulation. Um, she was um, uh, uh, working in the uh, uh, regional parliament in Venlo, the city council actually from 2006 to 2017, so she's very familiar also with the regional and communal uh, issues, with which are uh, very much hands-on, which is, I think, not bad to have it also uh, in the European Parliament. And as I said, she's uh, unfortunately not able to join us live, but uh, we have recorded her um, uh, her short uh, speech, and I would say uh, we start with that now. And Mats, up, please. Dear friends of eFuels Alliance and Maritime Platform, I cannot attend today's event because I'm in Strasbourg for the plenary session. 
Thank you for inviting me to discuss the role of e-fuels in the maritime sector and in particular the role of fuel EU maritime. I believe the EU must be an early adapter for decarbonized shipping. This week we reached an agreement in the TRAN committee and I look forward to the vote in plenary in two weeks. The text improves the Commission proposal making sure the e-fuels production and demand will increase. I worked hard during negotiations to include a sub-target for hydrogen and ammonia and we made it. It is the most straightforward way to ensure demand for e-fuels. We face the problem that massive quantitative of renewable electricity is hard to achieve in the short term. We need to start as soon as possible, give investors targets, facilitate investment planning and set a clear pathway to decarbonize the current fuel mix. Nowadays is a difficult time for European governments. EU policymakers face a dilemma, managing energy security and independence without losing sight of the climate neutrality target. The war in Ukraine is a wake-up call to push for more investments in renewables. And there are barriers to market uptake of e-fuels and it must be the role of policymakers to address them. As Shadow Rapporteur on Fuel EU, I spoke with many companies willing to invest and happy to support greening the sector. We need to provide them with the legal certainty for it. Therefore, the Parliament should encourage early movers with legislation, not lock the transport sector in fossil fuels or LNG. One of the most pressing barriers to e-fuel scale-up is costs. Investors should be rewarded for their efforts. In Fuel EU, we include a minimum e-fuels quota with a multiplier making it profitable for early movers. So the upcoming COP27 climate conference in November 2022 in Egypt will show whether policymakers worldwide are ready to take the necessary steps to reach net zero by 2050. In the TRAN committee this week, we took the first step in that direction. I wish you a successful event and look forward to attending in person the next one. Yeah, thank you very much, um, um, uh, Mrs. Tax. Um, we will take you by your work and we'll invite you uh, again next time and hope uh, you can attend there uh, then also in person. Um, a, a lot of passports were already uh, thrown into the debate, like costs, like sub quotas, like multipliers. Uh, I think there's already a lot of food for thought later for our discussion. But before that, we would like to introduce our next um, MEP. Uh, it's Mrs. Jutta Paulus. Uh, Mrs. Paulus is um, a German uh, MEP uh, from the Green Party. She also is in the European Parliament since 2019. And like Mrs. Tux, she is a member of the Committee of Transport and Tourism. Uh, and in that capacity, the other one of the other shadow rapporteurs here on the fuel in maritime uh, regulation. Um, uh, Jutta Paulus has a, a Green Party career. She was um, elected state chairwoman of the Rhineland Palatinate Green Party, it's a region in the southwest of Germany. Um, and also, she is in Strasbourg in sessions. Uh, that's because also she is um, uh, on screen now, uh, but not live. And uh, again, I uh, please the technique uh, to myself. The European Union has set the goal to become climate neutral by 2050 at the latest. And there is no doubt that we will need a substantial amount of synthetic fuels, e-fuels, in order to do so. Unfortunately, the debate has been poisoned by the notion that we can carry on as before using internal combustion engines for individual transport and serving all those cars with e-fuels. This will not work due to simply physical reasons, but we will need e-fuels. We will need them for the maritime sector. We will need them for aviation. And this is the reason why, why I am pushing in the respective legislation to have ambitious sub targets for those e fuels in those hard to decarbonize transport sectors. But there is another caveat. We are seeing actors claiming that they can produce e fuels at scale using non renewable sources, not bringing us on our path to climate neutrality. On the European level, we must make sure that e-fuels are green fuels, that they are produced from renewable energy, producing green hydrogen, and this hydrogen can then be used to produce those synthetic fuels. I will fight for those sub-targets, 
and I will stand up to those that are saying we can carry on as before and use e-fuels to power everything because simply on f for f a physical reason there is simply not enough land mass available to power all those cars. I think the e-fuel industry should take care to really promote their solutions for the places where it is really important. We will never be able to fly battery electric planes from not New York electric ships running from Shanghai to Rotterdam. So this is a place where we need e-fuels and now is the time to promote them. Thank you very much, Jutta Paulus. Um, of course, uh, that was um, uh, an open door uh, you ran through uh, with us because it is about green fuels and solutions. We as e-fuel producers, but also the shipping industry uh, in general want to provide. Uh, and that is actually what we want to discuss uh, uh, in detail uh, today. Um, so I already told you, we have a very distinguished panel uh, and I would uh, suggest that we start right away uh, with our speakers. Um, uh, of course, if you have uh, uh, from the audience any questions, um, as already mentioned, please um, uh, take the, the Q&A session uh, and put uh, your question uh, into the text. Um, I think there is somebody has to be uh, muted now because I have a, we have a huge noise now. Thank you very much. Um, uh, put your question into the F and A button uh, uh, and tell me also in the text to, to whom you want to uh, direct your question. Uh, I will try to put everything forward um, right away, uh, but also then later in our Q and A session, which we are planning to do after uh, our speakers. Um, we start now first with uh, uh, the European Commission. Um, and um, I'm very happy that we have Mr. Ricardo Battista uh, in the call. Um, uh, he is the policy officer at the European Commission's Directorate General for Mobility and Transport, in short, DG Move, uh, and there, especially in the Department for Water and Transport. Uh, he is responsible for topics such as sustainable shipping, alternative fuels, and the decarbonization of maritime transport. And he, uh, in addition, also coordinates the work of the Renewable and Low Carbon Fuels Value Chain Industrial Alliance. Well, that's a long name, but at least it's an alliance as the E-Fuel Alliance is as well. Um, before uh, this, he did this work, he worked at the European Maritime Safety Agency as a project officer for marine environment, sustainability and ship safety. Um, and he earned uh, personally a PhD on sustainable energy systems at the Techno Technical Institute of Lisbon. Uh, he describes himself as an enthusiast about all marine science related subjects. Uh, so, um, uh, Ricardo, the floor is yours to share your enthusiasm, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. Uh, a big, big uh, thank you to the organization for having us uh, on board. And uh, a particular word also to uh, say hi to all my uh, colleague panelists. Uh, I've selected uh, for the presentation today an e-fuel-centric uh, uh, presentation, uh, which will I will nevertheless uh, emphasize the angle of the relevance in the context of the fuel EU. And uh, in my very first slide, uh, uh, I have mapped the regulatory landscape for e-fuels in the EU. Uh, it's a very short presentation with only a couple more slides. But um, I present the e-fuels regulatory landscape in the context of the Repower EU uh, communication, where diversification, uh, energy saving, and acceleration of clean energy are put as the pillars for um, the e-fuel development in the EU. Um, if, when we talk about e-fuels, we talk, of course, uh, about uh, a family of fuels, which can be um, as, as extensive and as, as wide as the technology for their processing allows. Uh, of course, uh, in the context of e-fuels, we will have to, in, 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 to address what are the low carbon synthetic fuels produced in the context of what will be the certification framework of the gas directive. 
but also the renewable fuels of non-biologic origin uh, RFMBOs in the context of the certification under Red Tree revision. Um, the electrolyzer technology is a central uh, topic uh, of, of relevance here. Um, uh, in the context of the RFNBOs, currently two delegated acts are uh, uh, under development, the additionality delegated act and the greenhouse gas savings, both relevant for the hydrogen uh, and for the sustainable carbon uh, in the context of uh, sustainable e-fuel production. Underneath, uh, you have three topics, the transport of hydrogen in bulk, which is important in order to uh, ensure that even uh, delocalized uh, green energy sources, uh, renewable energy sources are available to the European context by enabling transportation of green hydrogen in bulk by sea. So this is a, an enabler in terms of a strategy that is relevant in order to enlarge uh, the capacity of uh, green hydrogen incorporation in the framework of e-fuel production. The use of e-fuels in transport is particularly uh, motivated by two legislative proposals under the Fit for 55, uh, the refuel EU aviation uh, mandating sustainable aviation fuel, and of particular focus, the fuel EU maritime, where targets for reduction of greenhouse gas intensity of the energy used on board ships are specified from 2025 to 2050. Uh, currently, uh, the, these are being uh, uh, under negotiation and under work under the, the work of the co-legislators, but in fact, uh, the promotion and the incentive for e-fuels uh, will come remarkably from, uh, uh, from an increasingly st stringent greenhouse gas intensity target as we move forward. As uh, we had uh, previously indicated by Ms. Veritax and Ms. Justopoulos, Indeed, uh, sub-targets are currently being brought into the fuel EU proposal, um, which are currently also under negotiation, and indeed also the multiplier uh, for the reward of early adopters of e-fuels. In terms of enablers, we need a focus on the energy conversion technology for ships. Uh, fuel cells remarkably are already available off the shelf, but they need to be uh, increased in terms of power, in terms of uh, uh, capacity, uh, energy density. Onboard storage technology, hydrogen chemical carriers also uh, for some solutions, safety technology, fuel certification, and green financing with the taxonomy just recently uh, under revision uh, of the Climate uh, Delegated Act in order to incorporate a life cycle approach uh, into the taxonomy, which will reward the use of uh, uh, options such as uh, synthetic fuels uh, on board ships. In my next slide, I've selected one of the recent initiatives of the Commission, the Renewable and Low Carbon Fuel Chain Alliance. The objectives are to increase uh, availability and scalability of uh, fuels uh, for maritime and uh, aviation, remarkably, uh, including uh, renewable synthetic fuels, sea fuels. Uh, there is a maritime roundtable which will uh, work on specific items uh, identified for maritime. Ultimately, the objective is to uh, ensure that the pipeline of project is identified that can be subject to funding and that can be uh, identified as the examples for uh, scalability and availability for maritime. Uh, and finally, uh, I've mapped uh, in, in the next slide, uh, the next and the last slide, um, how the uh, Alliance will uh, incorporate the work for synthetic fuels across and uh, in a horizontal way across the three sectors, aviation, waterborne and road. Um, there are uh, different alliances working already uh, with industry, uh, collaborative environment already established uh, on different uh, technologies, but now the synthetic fuels will gain uh, for sure in the, in the alliance uh, a new place to be uh, developed and to be promoted. I encourage any of you, any of the participants in the workshop today to have a look at the Alliance because you can join, you can apply and you can participate in this challenge uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo, um, uh, for this uh, first overview uh, from the European Commission side. Uh, what I, um, uh, uh, maybe two questions I would like to follow up uh, right away. Uh, 
uh, already some uh, questions are also coming in, but they are maybe more, a little bit more for, uh, for the panel later. Um, uh, in the parliament right now, there is a huge discussion, discussion on sub quotas um, for the maritime sector in, in the um, maritime aid rule, uh, regulation. The Commission didn't propose a sub quota for e fuels. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit why? The, the, yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, indeed, it's correct. Right now, the sub quotas uh, for e fuels are uh, being brought into the fuel new maritime proposal. The initial proposal from the Commission uh, is based on a technology neutral approach uh, where uh, we define uh, the goal. We define the greenhouse gas intensity reduction curve and we provide a variety of options for the operators. Uh, and so uh, by having this uh, goal-based approach, you incentivize uh, the market to develop in, uh, in a way that makes available both for existing ships and for different fleet uh, operating profiles variety of options. So you can have for short sea shipping, electrification, batteries, you can have a variety of options more available. And for deep sea shipping, uh, uh, blending of uh, biofuels or uh, advanced biofuels or synthetic fuels. So as the stringency of the goal progresses and becomes more ambitious with time, uh, options such as um, renewable synthetic fuels become uh, economically viable and economically appealing for the operators. So there is regulatory certainty in the sense that by having a goal-based approach, you ensure that uh, the economic viability of such fuels is, is there. And so supports financial uh, investment decision uh, already at this stage. Okay, thank you for that. So this, yeah, yeah, I you. think that will, be, that will be a part of our discussion later also with the uh, our colleagues from the fuel producing side, but maybe let me add one one more question, which is of course key in any sector, but maybe more in the maritime sector than, uh, for example, in road transport, and that is the issue of global competitiveness. Um, uh, if the EU is uh, bringing up a regulation, in the view of many uh, people in the shipping industry, it's a, a regional regulation, actually, because they think globally. Um, uh, and um, the question there, of course, would be what are the difficulties of introducing uh, this kind of regional climate legislation in this sector? And what were your thoughts when you developed the regulation of support mechanisms, maybe? Um, uh, you have looked into it or foreseen to overcome uh, potential disadvantages in that respect. So, Ralph, you had four, four or five questions in uh, in one question. So, I will <laughs> I will okay. definitely try to be uh, concise. But uh, thank you very much. Um, the issue of the regional versus international is is key. Uh, a regulation proposals such as the fuel EU being uh, of EU uh, uh, scope. Um, is in, in, in effect uh, imperfect because, in fact, we would only have a solution for what we try to promote in the fuel EU with an international reaching uh, uh, regulation. This is, however, the first step and the first step uh, given by the EU with a clear demonstration of the way forward, a uh, clear demonstration of the priority. Uh, and therefore, we aim and we support at international level in IMO the, the promotion of uh, a similar approach, of uh, a, a similar structured regulation development uh, at the international level. And we hope that uh, definitely this is uh, taking place faster rather than uh, uh, slower. And in fact, when it takes place, we will align with the international context. This is already a commitment uh, in the fuel EU. Having said that, the challenges of the regional versus international are remarkable, especially because the maritime sector is such a global uh, business. I would maybe select one challenge that we are addressing, it, that we are uh, ensuring that uh, will be in place for the implementation, which is the international certification scheme that will require for fuels, not which will be able to be bunkered not only in Europe, but also uh, internationally. So based not only on the sustainability certification in red, but also in other elements to include other economical operators, 
we are developing a, a framework for the certification of, uh, of fuels, which will be assisting uh, fuel EU implementation. Um, and in fact, the only way uh, really to ensure that the competitiveness aspect is, uh, uh, is uh, guaranteed is to insist on the international developments uh, and, uh, and consider that the European uh, is the first step. And uh, I believe a very good and firm first step towards uh, uh, a decarbonized maritime transport. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. There are two questions to you in the chat uh, in the f &A. Maybe you could look into it and answer also by typing, or we get them through later on in our Q&A session. Um, but thank you very much so far uh, for the Commission's perspective. Um, I would like to move on now with our panel and uh, get give the floor to Wolf Stiefel. Um, since we are doing this event as eFuel Alliance together with the Maritime Platform, uh, and he's one of the chairmen of the Maritime Platform, and uh, he is also the Regional Chief Executive Marine and Offshore for Bureau Veritas Group. Um, uh, Bureau Veritas is a listed inspection, classification, and certification company, which originated from an office for maritime insurance. Uh, and Bureau Veritas pursues the goal of supporting shipping companies on their way to efficient and sustainable shipping. So um, I would assume uh, Wolf has the, a quite pretty good overview on the sector and on the developments, not only in Europe, but also, uh, of course, uh, globally. Uh, therefore, we are very happy uh, that he's uh, with us now. Uh, he previously worked for Winter to Gas and Diesel as Vice President Sales and Marketing and at Vatsila, a provider of technologies and solutions for the shipping and energy market. Uh, and of course, he has a technical uh, background. Uh, he holds a master's degree in industrial engineering. Um, so, uh, Rolf, uh, please, you have the floor for your perspective. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ralf, uh, for, for the floor. And uh, it's a really a great pleasure to, to be able, as uh, one of the chairmen of the Maritime Platform, to be here on the eFuel uh, Alliance or to do this event together to discuss this uh, important topic uh, going forward. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the shipping industry is, uh, uh, as we heard earlier also in the, in the entry statements, is one of the hard to decarbonize uh, sectors. And that is because of these huge power density, which is required, especially for ocean going ships. And exactly here already starts one of the problems we are facing. We have to consider that shipping is not just the same everywhere and uh, uh, in all aspects. There are different segments in shipping. And uh, we heard it also from Ricardo. We, we have uh, short sea shipping. We have uh, shippings which are more in, in coastal waters, uh, short distances. We have uh, ferries uh, which are on a, on a very dedicated routes. Uh, we have uh, then the ocean going ships where you have containers uh, going also pretty much fixed routes uh, uh, and so on and so on, which opens actually uh, a full uh, range of possibilities going forward to, uh, to decarbonize. And uh, definitely if you look at uh, co uh, very uh, local shipping activities and uh, short sea ferries, we see a lot of developments around electricity even. We see the fuel cell slowly coming in, still having, as Ricardo mentioned, the topic of size and the topic of really combining it to, uh, to bigger uh, power levels. And there are also some other technicalities in terms of load acceptance and so on. We don't need to touch right here, but there will be a lot of these kind of options in, in one area uh, more than in another. But if you look at the deep sea shipping, and here I mean uh, ships with, uh, with substantial uh, cargo capacity and long routes, and even having uh, many of them uh, complicated routes to, to accomplish, they never really know where they are, uh, where they're gonna be in three months or in two months or even in two weeks, which uh, makes, uh, from an international point of view, which makes it uh, very difficult when you look at uh, the fuel they should use also from a, a logistics and bunkering uh, possibility. So. Shipping is one of these hard to decarbonize uh, sectors. Nevertheless, 
we also have to accept that uh, decarbonizing also means to increase efficiency, increasing efficiency in terms of routing, in, uh, increasing efficiency in terms of uh, optimizing the speed, less waiting time, uh, uh, as we have seen it now with the, with the congestion in ports. Uh, this plays a major role together, for instance, also uh, in terms of the fuel consumption, the greenhouse gas emissions the industry does. Further uh, shipping can be improved by increasing the efficiency of the ship as well. Uh, Wind-assisted propulsion, there are solutions going on with adding uh, sails to support uh, the uh, propulsion efficiency to increase actually uh, uh, or decrease basically the fuel consumption for the ton mile cargo transported. And all this needs to be integrated. At the end of the day, there will be a major part in the I assume it will be in the range between uh, 50 to or between 50 to 70 percent, which can only be decarbonized going towards 2050 by applying e-fuels. So basically, fuels which, when they are combusted, when they are used in fuel cells or in, in internal combustion engines, depending on the technology available at that uh, stage, uh, uh, without a greenhouse gas or CO2 equivalent emissions. And this uh, needs to be uh, looked at. There are various players, names as e-fuels, uh, as we have seen already, uh, e-methanol, e-ammonia, e-methane, and also liquid, uh, liquid e-fuels, uh, which would be similar to diesel fuels. All of those have a role to play going forward and uh, will need to be considered in order to decarbonize shipping. And the biggest topic we are facing right now in the industry is the high level of uncertainty for the players, where they should place their bets. Should I go for this fuel? Should I go for that fuel? Should I prepare for this? Should I prepare for that? And to make a selection. And here, uh, the support from a political level is definitely required to ensure that the early movers are not the one which are making a mistake and losing in this global uh, business their uh, uh, competitiveness because they have been spending more when they have been investing in new assets. That's one issue which needs to be addressed and where we are very much looking into uh, on the political and regulatory side. The other topic is that we need to consider that shipping is uh, the ships which are operating now or which are delivered in these days, they will be operating for at least 25 to 30 years. So if you want to achieve something substantial, we also need to address existing vessels. And addressing existing vessels always mean you need to do a certain level of reinvestment, retrofit to make them fit for these additional fuels or new fuels. And here, uh, as we know, the e-fuels have totally different uh, capabilities. Uh, liquid e-synthetic uh, e-diesel, for instance, it's a one-to-one -one blend in fuel for existing tonnage where actually the amount of complexity to uh, reduce emissions in shipping is extremely low. Whereas if we say shipping needs to be the industry to use ammonia as fuel, uh, this is not something which can be adopted easily into vessels which have been built today for maybe LNG or for, uh, for, uh, for, for uh, MGO, normal classical diesel fuels. So here we need the support from a political point of view going forward. Ralph, I hope this uh, was good for you as an introduction to this topic. I hope it was good for the audience, actually. For <laughs> me, it was uh, absolutely perfect. Thank you very much, Wolf. Um, I mean, um, what I learned since I'm a newcomer in the shipping uh, sector is that um, completely different to the car and truck discussion, for example, where we have a discussion about different propulsion systems, be it electrification or combustion engines and we have the discussion of phasing out a combustion engine at all uh, it's i think it's quite clear that combustion technology will be uh, in in the future the major part uh, it will play the major part in the shipping area uh, your problem uh, so to speak is what fuel uh, would it be at the end of the day because there are many options as you pointed out uh, they have their advantages and disadvantages uh, so uh, what I would be would find interesting uh, also for the audience, because, uh, of course, po political support is needed, but uh, can 
political support look like? So, so to speak, politicians decide now it has to be the diesel. Or uh, how, how can actually the political support can look like uh, in that respect? Because um, if you have many options and if also um, uh, different shipping companies are trying out different options now and maybe different options are also viable for different uh, use cases. Um, uh, so, so what would be uh, the, the political support? For example, would it help you if you have a sub quota for e-fuels um, in general, or is that something you, you would not uh, like to see very much? Yeah, it's, as you say, uh, the, the technology or the energy converter is not such a big topic uh, than in the, in the automotive industry on the, on the maritime side. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, the internal combustion engine is going to play uh, also a role if we go into the age of the e-fuels. Uh, as soon as they uh, are becoming available. So from that point of view, you're right, it's more about the fuel we are looking at. And, uh, and here uh, we also, need, I mean, we need an openness uh, related to which fuel it should be, because there is a, a lot of contenders, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, for instance, uh, we, ha we have now a lot of ships uh, which are in, or a lot of owners which are investing in LNG fuel ships. I mean, this is a very controversial discussion as well because LNG is still in fossil fuel and actually a lot of companies or uh, NGOs are claiming that uh, uh, the, the industry is doing a wrong step and is, is locking in themselves into something which is completely wrong and it will be stranded assets and so on and so on and so on. Nevertheless, what is always missing is that actually one very good alternative is emethane. Uh, as well, you know, it, fossil LNG is one fuel which is available today, uh, helping to reduce emissions, uh, maybe less the greenhouse gas than it is reducing other emissions like NOx, SOx, and, and particulates. And as soon as uh, uh, the e methane, e fuel e methane would become available, it would be very helpful to have a drop in quota, for instance, saying that by 2030. Uh, every LNG fuel ship or every ship should have a 5% uh, greenhouse gas uh, free fuel. And then the synthetic LNG would automatically be able, or bio LNGs or whatever, to be dropped in into the existing supply chain and reduce the carbon intensity of, of the industry. Uh, the same applies uh, for e methanol and the same applies for e ammonia. Technology for LNG methanol is basically ready on board of ships, the technology to have ammonia as a fuel, which, yes, it's absolutely carbon free. So it's a dream, the dream e-fuel actually for shipping, but the technology is not ready yet. It will require another three to five years to get that mature. And we have to see also, we always need to look at the existing fleet and uh, any fuel which has a drop-in capability has obviously uh, a big chance to make a bigger impact on a medium and short, on a short term and medium term, uh, because the assets are already out there, the potential consumers. So quotas would definitely help, yeah, especially because the industry is preparing for uh, for uh, being able to consume those e-fuels going forward. All right, and may I add maybe one uh, more question, which is of course uh, also interesting because. Um, when you take the big container ships, of course, you have thousands, 100,000 millions of goods in there, depends on the size, of course. Um, one should think if it's true that if you are more expensive uh, uh, in the future, uh, it should not be a big problem to, um, to overwhelm those costs to the potential customers. Um, how is this in reality? So if you are a ship owner and you're running container ships, um, uh, it, can you easily overcome costs to your customers, or is that a, a major problem? So. I mean, actually, if you look at uh, a, a container ship and the container business, it's actually pretty easy because the ship owner is chartering the vessel to a cargo owner, and the cargo owner is responsible to pay for the fuel. So actually, the ship owner is not paying for the fuel bill. So from that point of view, it's an absolutely uh, easy question to, to roll over uh, these costs. Uh, furthermore, if, if 
we look into the history of shipping, we always had ups and downs also in the oil price. And uh, we have seen phases where uh, uh, one ton of bunker fuel has been at $700, $800 uh, per ton. And we have seen uh, a couple of months later, uh, a cost of maybe uh, $200, $250 a ton. And shipping has not been disrupted, even though the fuel costs have been double or tripling even compared to something before. It always went on. And by the way, also the sneakers didn't got cheaper because the fuel got cheaper after the, the boom in 2016, for instance, going forward, then the fuel price came down a lot. Nothing got cheaper. So yes, for sure, especially in an industry like the container business, uh, that is possible. And I think even the cargo owners are really willing to even take the cost uh, for more expensive fuels uh, in order to decarbonize their supply chain and to, to, to make good uh, for all the commitments the uh, society is asking for. Nevertheless, we have a problem of pure availability uh, today. Yeah, that's absolutely, uh, that's for sure. Um, I think uh, our colleagues from the fuel producing side uh, who are next on the panel can tell us something about that. Uh, well, thank you very much so far. Uh, we will come back. There are some questions coming in uh, already also for you. If you wish, look, uh, please look into the F&A. Maybe you can answer some also via text, uh, but we will come back to them then later uh, in the Q&A session. Thanks. Thanks so far. Um, our next speaker now is uh, uh, Mrs. Delphi Gozilo. Um, uh, welcome. Um, uh, she is uh, working for Transport and Environment. Transport and Environment is the uh, European umbrella uh, organization for the NGOs, mainly dealing in the environmental uh, sector. Um, uh, she is uh, the policy officer for sustainable shipping uh, uh, in TNE, um, and she works on at accelerating emissions reductions of maritime transport, focusing on the use of sustainable alternative marine fuels and zero emissions ships. Uh, before joining TNE, Delphine worked in the gas and heating industries, where she specialized on hydrogen and energy efficiency. Uh, she's French uh, from uh, origin, and her background is in law and political science, so not a technician this time. Um, uh, she has a master's degree from the Institute of Political Studies of Paris in EU public affairs and also in energy policies. Uh, and in addition to that, TNE has recently published a paper on the price effect of sustainable shipping. I assume that Delphine will also look into that uh, in her presentation. So uh, welcome again, uh, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So I'll share the presentation. Can you all see it? Right. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Right, so thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, I will focus on uh, so presenting our uh, latest study uh, on the costs of clean shipping. And because so as transport and environment, we regularly publish studies uh, in the on the transport sector as a whole. Uh, I'm part of the uh, shipping team, and uh, here our vision to decarbonize shipping well, is quite close to uh, what uh, some speakers have already mentioned before me, uh, meaning that uh, for smaller ships, uh, battery electric technologies are uh, probably the most viable option. But as soon as uh, you start looking at uh, larger ships, then hydrogen really becomes uh, the um, uh, most obvious option uh, to dec uh, decrease emissions uh, over the long term and really achieve uh, our decarbonization goals by 2050. Um, so ammonia is generally considered as the, the most cost competitive fuel. Uh, however, for this study, we uh, looked at uh, all uh, of the different fuels. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we looked at the prices for end consumers. Uh, for example, uh, if you were to order uh, a pair of sneakers uh, in uh, on Amazon, for example, and uh, this would be shipped uh, from a container uh, starting in Asia to Europe, then what would be the additional cost uh, if the ship were to be powered uh, on hydrogen? So, <clears throat> well, the result is quite clear. Uh, it wouldn't cost more than a few cents. 
And why such a result? Well, that's the magic of shipping container economics, because there are so many boxes that uh, you can put on a container ship that the economies of scale uh, make sure that the price of the fuel is uh, passed on quite easily to consumers. And we did these calculations uh, in the context of the European Parliament debate, because we had some difficulties in the transport committee. The rapporteur was convinced that uh, having a mandate on hydrogen in shipping would be disastrous uh, for consumers' costs of living. And uh, our answer was to uh, build this model where we could actually show uh, what was the real impact of having more ambitious uh, fuel in maritime. Uh, but also more ambitious ETS. So the prices that you can see here uh, are actually a, a combined effect of uh, more ambitious measures. So this is uh, minus 40% uh, GHG intensity reductions by 2030, uh, up from uh, 6%, which was in the commission proposal, uh, a 6% EFU uh, sub-target, and uh, applying the ETS costs onto the whole uh, life cycle emissions. So not just the tailpipe, uh, but also uh, the on the well to wake uh, approach. So this, uh, this explains so, uh, just uh, less than one cent more uh, on a pair of sneakers. Next, of course, uh, it might be affordable for consumers, but how about shipping companies, right? Uh, would they be able to support these additional costs? Well, what we calculated is that on the price of one container, uh, the additional cost would be uh, from 8 euros more to 40 euros more. So this is quite reasonable, and especially when we know that uh, shipping companies have recorded really record profits uh, this year and last year following the COVID crisis. So this this means that today they're in very good financial health and they can cover just like a few percent more uh, on the price uh, of a container. So it's not an excuse not to start investing in uh, cleaner vessels. Uh, so this is just the last data uh, that we have. Uh, we also looked at the hypothesis uh, where uh, you would power the ship entirely on green hydrogen or derivatives of green hydrogen the result is not so much different. Huh? Uh, it's about eight cents more uh, on a pair of shoes, so one euro on the TV and up to eight euros uh, for a fridge. So voila, which really means uh, for us uh, in terms of conclusion that uh, shipping is kind of the ideal end consumer of hydrogen because uh, unlike other sectors, so for example, if you were to put hydrogen in passenger cars or for domestic heating, uh, the costs, the high costs would be borne directly by the end consumer. Whereas here, uh, thanks to the fact that uh, we can distribute the costs uh, on a big container ship, this makes things uh, quite easier. Um, so voila. And last but not least, uh, here are our proposals. So how to encourage the uptake of e-fuels in shipping, because despite the fact that uh, it's not so costly at uh, the scale of a container, uh, there are many barriers to the uptake, and here we believe that we should have a supply chain approach. Um, and this is where so the Renewable Energy uh, Directive has been uh, quite helpful. Uh, the Parliament has voted already to have a mandate on fuel suppliers to deliver enough e-fuels for a maritime. And now we are expecting uh, the Parliament to take a position indeed. Uh, in the coming weeks to, to confirm a sub quota and hopefully to, to increase it because we originally uh, uh, recommended 6% and not just 2%. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much um, uh, for your uh, initial thoughts. Um, what I uh, thank you also for pointing out the renewable energy directive, which I find very interesting because um, right now um, uh, there is a, a huge debate going on also on the uh, overall sub quota for the transport sector in the renewable energy directive. Um, uh, here, um, uh, transport and environment is quite reluctant uh, to um, 
uh, as, as far as I can see, uh, to lift uh, the quotas uh, above the commission proposals, for example. But wouldn't that be also helping uh, the shipping uh, uh, sector if you have uh, an overall sub-quota? Because, of course, if you include all transport modes into the increase of uh, supply and production of e-fuels, uh, uh, that would lead then at the end of the day to much more industrialized investments here, right? Well, I would differ um, on the answer because so the point is that now we have a 5.7% uh, of uh, transport fuels that would have to be delivered in the form of e-fuels to the whole of the transport sector. So according to the, the council and the, the parliament's position, uh, we believe it's quite a lot when we look at the, the end uses for it, because uh, in transport, uh, you have heavy duty modes, such as shipping and aviation, where there is clear need uh, for hydrogen. And this was very well explained by uh, Mrs. Jutta Paulus uh, at the beginning of the event. However, for cars, uh, now we have a very clear mandate uh, from EU policymakers that from 2035, uh, no internal combustion engines will be allowed uh, for new new cars. So oh. this means inevitably that uh, well the the overall target uh, is a bit too much considering that uh, for shipping, well actually you would just need 0.8 percent of uh, transport fuels to be uh, delivered uh, to the maritime sector in the form of e-fuels. So, and this would correspond to 6% what we are asking for uh, in maritime demand by 2030, of course. Uh, so this makes a lot of volumes and uh, yeah, it's really kind of a, how to, to make a priority of certain sectors. I think that it's more efficient to have sub targets uh, such as the one that the, the parliament has uh, just adopted for uh, the renewable energy directive. So that we make sure that these volumes actually end up in the in the right sectors, because there are barriers to the entry there. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much for that. There is a direct question to your presentation, which I would read out because that links directly to uh, to uh, what you presented about the costs. Um, uh, the the uh, question is: This presentation is highly provocative without showing the calculations behind these statements. What is the bottom line of your calculation? How much will one ton of alternative fuel shipping fuel cost? Right. I mean, it's a very fair question. And uh, the, so the prices that we used are uh, 2030 estimates, huh? because mm -hmm. uh, our goal was really to, to feed in the, the policy debate. And we're talking about mandates from 2030, not uh, from now on. And then secondly, uh, this was based on a, a literature review, so we, the, the costs are not just from a single study, but uh, there are price ranges, so minimum, maximums, uh, taking into account uh, more or less conservative uh, studies, and all e-fuels are considered, as well as uh, the prices of diesel, the prices of LNG, uh, before, after the COVID crisis, and uh, all of these costs are available online uh, on our website. So you can download also the, the calculation sheet and uh, actually make the, the math yourself. Uh, you can plug in uh, the, the data of uh, one ship uh, and uh, yeah, try to find a pathway, for example, using e-methanol, uh, put the, the percentage of e-methanol that you'd like to have with uh, six or 13 percent GAG targets. Uh, this is quite flexible, so I really invite you to, to use it. All right, thank you very much. This answers the next question. So my, uh, please, could you put the, the link to this study into the chat uh, here? Because that was the question if the study is published already and uh, is, if it's accessible, but this is uh, answered by now. So thank you very much uh, so far. Um, with this question about fuel costs, actually, that's the perfect moment to add to um, a actual fuel producer um, or uh, uh, also a future fuel producer. Um, I would like to introduce Benoit Decouf. Um, he is from Elise Energy. Um, he's co-founder and COO, actually, of uh, Elise Energy. 
Um, Elise uh, Energy is a French e-fuels project developer and producer of e-methanol, uh, among others also for the maritime sector. Um, uh, Benoit has more than 15 years experience in the energy sector with focus on low carbon technologies and energy system decarbonization, such as power to X, hydrogen and renewable power. Um, uh, with that, I would hand over to you, Benoit, and uh, we are looking forward to your presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, providing me the opportunity to, to share uh, today my, uh, uh, my, my view and the perspective of one producer, it is Energy, that uh, you introduced. So just um, uh, a few words of, of, of introduction. Um, it has been said. Uh, but obviously, what um, um, what, what provides uh, or what was sorry uh, uh, the, the, the the point of origin of the company is our conviction that um, uh, we need to reach net zero, and that if we want to need uh, to to reach net zero, we need to decarbonize all sectors, including the so-called um, hard to abate energy sectors, including shipping, and we need to do it now. And if we want to do that. Um, obviously, energy efficiency is key, electrification is key when it's possible, but due to the share of molecules as part of the existing final energy, final energy consumption, due to the existing infrastructure um, uh, behind it, green molecules, low carbon molecules will be key. When we say um, uh, green molecules, in our view, um, what it means? Um, it means three distinct, uh, but also linked technological landscapes. The first one is bioenergy with a number of underlying technology, digestion, fermentation, and so on and so forth. Hydrogen, of course, with um, green hydrogen or low carbon hydrogen produced by means of water electrolysis, but also blue hydrogen with uh, steam methane reforming plus CCS. And last but not least, carbon capture utilization and storage, CCUS, uh, with storage or use. And we, when it comes to, to, to this energy and obviously to, to today's presentation, uh, we are focused as a company on e-fuels that are the, at, the, at the intersection of those three uh, technological landscapes when CO2 is biogenic, or at least of two, when the uh, CO2 is, is from industrial nature, and that might be a, a point of discussion later on today. So it is in short, and what we do, um, uh, it has been said, we are uh, an industrial SME, French. We have been created two years ago in 2020. We are, as of today, 30 FTEs located in France, in Marseille, in Lyon, where I'm myself based, but also in Madrid to cover our activities in Spain and, and Portugal. We've as a mission to provide low carbon solution for how to abate energy applications, which concretely uh, means that we do design, we develop, we finance and we aim to build and operate um, e-fuel and e-biofuel production facility. In that regard, and to that end, uh, we focused on our side on two types of e-fuels. It has been mentioned, there are a number of, of them uh, and a number of energy queries that might be of interest for, for, for shipping. On our side, uh, we are working only on liquid e-fuel under atmospheric conditions that are carbon-based, namely methanol uh, for shipping and for the industrial sectors and sustainable aviation fuel for obviously aviation. The point, and I think it's, it's an important uh, element uh, that has been uh, uh, evoked uh, previously by, by my fellow panelists, is to deploy um, objects, so units, uh, uh, production facilities that are bankable, so for which we need to have access to, to private finance. Uh, that can be replicable and that can be scalable in order to follow uh, the needs of the market. And in our hand, um, uh, as of today, we, we are working on, on France and, 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 and uh, Portugal, Spain. So um, finally, on, on, on this very uh, uh, first note, I will not mention two of the markets we, we, we are working on industry and sustainable aviation fuel, because it's not the point of today's presentation, but I still uh, mentioned them here. Why? Because um, we need to keep in mind that those molecules are versatile, uh, which is 
uh, both a good thing and uh, a potential, um, um, how to say that, danger or, or weaknesses for, for marine fuel, because it means that um, the fuels that might be used as alternative marine fuels can be also uh, of interest for other sectors. Uh, it provides um, the way to develop large projects as of today to cope with regulatory uncertainty, with uh, uh, the ability to edge between different markets. But on the other side, it means that tomorrow, um, if sustainable aviation fuel are able to pay more than for alternative marine fuel, there might be a competition also between sectors. Finally, on, on the project as of today, so on our side, um, we have a 100 kilotons SAF project that will be based in France, um, uh, that is uh, both uh, mixing advanced biofuel and hydrogen. And when it comes to shipping, we have a program called M France for Electromethanol France, uh, which aim to produce 500 kilotons of electromethanol by 2027. Um, that will be located in France, but split it onto four sites. Uh, so four different um, uh, platforms where we will be uh, grid connected. And in that case, um, uh, the point um, is to make sure that we can develop those projects as um, quickly as possible, but also that we can, in that, in, in that objective, reach the utilities that we need, meaning electricity. That's the first, uh, uh, the first input when it comes to e-fuel, to indirect electrification, but also CO2 and the different utilities that you need, such as water, uh, both to produce um, hydrogen, but also as a cooling, and heat that might be needed for carbon capture and distillation of methane. So with that, um, I will end this uh, uh, very uh, uh, short uh, introducer, introductory notes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Benoit. Um, uh, maybe two questions uh, to you from, uh, first of all, we just heard that uh, there is um, there are different options, fuel options, uh, um, discussed uh, when it comes to shipping. Um, uh, fr from a pure uh, producer point of view, also including the cost, the potential cost side of the different options, which are discussed like such as diesel uh, or uh, methanol or ammonium um, or even hydrogen. Uh, what would What is your take uh, uh, in that respect? So if you could decide um, uh, which fuel uh, actually would you produce for uh, for ships, um, which would be the easiest and maybe also the most cost effective? Okay, now, um, thank you for the question. I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm very aligned with what has been said beforehand. Um, and that's one of the specific of shipping, unlike aviation, for instance. For aviation, at least for, uh, uh, for now, uh, you have a sustainable kerosene, uh, sustainable aviation fuel and different pathway to produce it. For shipping, you have different energy carriers. Uh, you have methanol, you have ammonia, you have uh, e-methane, you have EDZ that has been mentioned, you have green hydrogen, biofuel. So you have a number of energy carriers. And um, I agree with what has been said. I think um, um, uh, there will be different options that will coexist, um, at least for some time, and depending on the different market segments that have been mentioned. And we can witness it with some of um, the shipping companies that have been announcing and ordering both ships for LNG. So whether it is uh, based on fossil LNG or bio LNG or e-LNG and also methanol. Um, so we think that um, those options will coexist. On our side, uh, for Elise, we have made one choice. <laughs> so as a consequence, uh, uh, I, will, I, I will explain why, but we have decided from the very beginning to focus on methanol for different reasons. The first one is there is beyond shipping an existing market for methanol as an industrial feedstock. That's true as well for ammonia, actually. That's true as well for hydrogen, but that's an important reason because whatever happens in the shipping, uh, we think that we might have uh, alternative options. 
Um, and the second one, which is our, which are much more related to, to the shipping part, is first we can produce methanol as of today made of bankable technologies. We can finance them. It's mature enough uh, to develop it on a large scale. Um, on the shipping side, the the bunkering is largely available because methanol is traded. So you have bunkering facilities in a number of ports as of today. Um, it's very easy to distribute it. You can use a largely available infrastructure as well. And as was mentioned just before myself and before during the panel, um, you have available engines that are on the shelf that can be used uh, and you can retrofit to existing uh, um, uh, ships. So uh, that's for me a, a very important reason why we have chosen and selected methanol when it comes to cost. Um, I would say that as of today, um, a good reference range of production costs is a, a, about 1,000 euros per ton, um, which means and which needs to be compared if you want to, to have a, a real comparison, you need to double this price because uh, the energy density of methanol is twice lower than conventional fuel. So the right, the right way of comparing it is, is to double this and, and, and you'll have the existing um, uh, the existing point of reference. Um, having said that, I think it's a question of uh, um, uh, euros per tons of CO2 avoided. And this would give the competitive landscape between methanol and EPS, methane and so on and so forth. And obviously um, it will depend as well um, on, uh, on the ability of our customer to pass it to their end consumer uh, as, it, uh, as it was uh, uh, mentioned beforehand by uh, transport and environment. Okay, um, would be very interesting to hear from uh, Wolf Stiefel maybe later how how we see this uh, uh, cost range uh, in the Q and A session. Uh, uh, last question from my side to you um, uh, is: um, I mean, you are actually investing or planning to invest in Europe, um, uh, so. Why Europe, and how do you see the regulatory framework right now in Europe for uh, actually uh, these investments? Or, or do you have a wish to the European Commission, for example, um, <laughs> in that respect? Um, no. So thank you for the question. So we we, we are European based. We are very much um, um, uh, willing to to develop projects in Europe, and we think that um, it has been at the forefront Europe of, of the development of e fuel for some time. Um, so it was a uh, pretty logical for us uh, to invest. All the more that we think that together with decarbonation, the production of e fuel for some part at least um, provide also an opportunity to relocate part of the production and to uh, contribute to energy security, which is uh, and which has become um, uh, over the past few months uh, a question of interest. Um, so that's the reason why we have started in, in, in this market where me, myself and my associate come from because we have been developing um, in our previous life um, um, uh, operator in the field of renewable gases and renewable power. Um, when it comes to, to, to the European regulation, I think that what is very important is to know the rules of the game. And so I think that as everyone for some time, um, uh, we need to have a stable uh, and definite uh, uh, regulatory context to figure out what we can do, what we can't do, and to probably adjust the cost range that I mentioned. Because we have been investing so far in the pre-development phase so to find the right place, um, to secure the grid connection, to secure CO2 and so on and so forth. We are entering now the second phase of our project, which means higher development cost, high risk uh, before final investment decision. And now uh, we have been working with different scenarios to cope with uncertainties, but now I need, we need, uh, it is energy, but I think it's true for our peers um, to know what type of CO2 we can use is it possible to use only biogenic CO2? Can we use as well, at least for some time, industrial CO2? What type of electricity we can use? Obviously, the usual uh, um, 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 question on the, on the renewable electricity, but in France, we have some question mark as well, <laughs> as you might imagine on, uh, uh, on, on the roles of nuclear power. Um, at least we need to know what we, need, what we can do. And last but not least, uh, what are the obligations 
downstream of the end user. Based on that, I will have an ability to know what will be my cost of power, and that's the primary, the largest driver of the cost of production, what will be the cost of CO2. And based on that, I will have a better view of the competitive landscape <laughs> between EMF and all and its, its, uh, its uh, competitors, and also between shipping an alternative use of methanol, uh, especially the industrial sectors, and tomorrow perhaps sustainable aviation fuel fuel through um, um, uh, alcohol to jet. So for me, that's the key question. And once we have that, obviously we also need to make sure, and it has been mentioned by MEPs in the introduction to deploy sufficient power, because if we want to substitute uh, fossil carbon-based molecule with indirect electrification, we need electricity at scale. And last but not least, we also need um, to get um, a permitting process that are fast enough. And I'm also saying that for France, especially. We have been uh, inaugurating the very first offshore wind parks in France, 10 years after it was launched, a bit more. Uh, we want to avoid having the same type of issue with e-fuel if we, if we want to meet the sub-quotas that have been mentioned typically. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, Benoit for that. Um, we come back to later. There are some questions also for you in the chat. Um, uh, but now let's go from the fuels right away to the propulsion technology. Um, uh, we're very happy uh, to have MIN uh, Energy Solutions uh, in our call. Uh, in person, Rüdiger Schmidt. Um, uh, Rüdiger Schmidt is Head of Sales and Promotion Germany at MIN Energy Solutions SA. Uh, of course, MIN Energy Solutions is a very well-known company headquartered in Germany, uh, a supplier of large diesel engines and systems for maritime and stationary applications, and thus is strongly committed to empowering sustainable shipping, but it also develops components for the e-fuel production, uh, like synthesis re reactors uh, as well. So you are actually technology provider on both sides, uh, on both ends of this uh, value chain. Uh, Rüdiger earned uh, uh, his degree in economic engineering from the Technical University of Kaiserslautern, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Please. Uh, thank you very much, Rod, for the introduction. Hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Good. Very good. So it's a pleasure being here today uh, on this nice afternoon for the eFuel Alliance. E-fuels are a very important uh, part for us as MIN. Um, we have uh, just a second. Why it's not moving the slide? Yeah. Um, we have decarbonization already since uh, quite a long time on our agenda, and we put a lot of efforts into it. Um, Fifty percent. Um, of global freight is uh, transported by MIN engines. And um, of this, uh, yeah, uh, shipping is responsible for 3% of the global CO2 emissions. So that means that, uh, yeah, with, uh, yeah, to put this into relation, that approximately uh, 1 to 1.5% 1 of the global CO2 emissions um, yeah, are yeah, coming through our engines and um, at sea. And uh, this is quite a huge number, and we are very well aware uh, that this needs to be go down. Um, in comparison, for example, to uh, to the roads, uh, where yeah, these uh, decarbonization is maybe a little bit easier when you just switch to batteries, uh, which is not such an easy task, but it's uh, a little bit easier maybe as in the heart uh, to abate sectors like shipping or aviations, where e-fuels are the more or less only solution uh, to bring down. Uh, the CO2 uh, emissions globally. So we as MIN, we are now uh, looking into this decarbonization uh, topic in a global view. Uh, we are not only uh, yeah, in shipping, uh, which is uh, so far the main uh, part of our company, but we are as well in many other segments active, which are very uh, interesting and important, uh, important for the uh, carbonization. Uh, let's start with number one. Um, we are uh, now um, investing a lot of uh, money and efforts in the production of electrolyzers. We have taken over the company HTEC uh, some years ago, 
Now uh, we have just uh, made the decision to put half a billion euro into yeah, the scaling up of the production of electrolyzer. No matter in what direction you go, hydrogen is always the basis and foundation for all of the e-fuels. And then you mix this uh, yeah, hydrogen. And then we come into yeah, point number four, the power to X process. Um, we are as well building reactors where we mix the hydrogen with uh, CO2 and maybe later on as well with nitrogen to produce methane and methanol out of green hydrogen and later on as well uh, green ammonia. And um, that's where we are today. <clears throat> and this is then the basis for uh, yeah, the shipping industry to have the green fuels. Just as an example, I don't want to go too much into it. Um, we see here, second. We see here the different fuels uh, on the bottom side. And um, so it's at the moment just a, yeah, a framework. So it's not finally decided, but what it it's looks like. So um, we see the capability of the fuels to uh, yeah, comply with the future emission legislations for the years 2025 to yeah, 2050. And uh, the very low levels can only be achieved by uh, biofuels or synthetic fuels. So fossil fuels are, yeah, are out of range quite soon. The only possibility or how to say with fossil fuels, uh, the most long lasting possibility is uh, to run LNG on our high pressure two stroke engines. In four stroke engines, it's a little bit different, but um, with our uh, two stroke engines, the high pressure injection, uh, we can avoid yeah, nearly completely the methane slip. So we have a real CO2 reduction on, on this technology by 20 to 25%, which is quite good for our first step. Then, as already mentioned by Benoit, we see as well methanol at the moment as a, a yeah, or as the main uh, fuel, which is in the main discussion. Yeah, for the next five to 10 years. And uh, here, I, here is, I want, just want to point out uh, the, yeah, the path with methanol. So when we uh, have the draft of the fuel EU, so from 2025 on to 2030 and so on, the share which need to be blended in into the fossil fuels needs to be increased. And uh, methanol here has some uh, quite advantages. One big advantage is uh, the, the capex when you build a vessel and you make it yeah, ready or already fitted uh, perfectly for methanol. It's cheaper than uh, compared to LNG or ammonia. And methanol is as well easy for bunkering. So you don't need this uh, cylindrical tanks like for yeah, hydrogen, LNG or ammonia. We are, regarding the technology, we as MIN, we are ready. The technology on the vessels is uh, there. Maersk is really pushing a lot uh, into uh, methanol as the future fuel. Um, we have, uh, it's not included here, but uh, today it was announced that uh, Maersk is going for another six, 17,000 TU container vessels as well, fueled by methanol. Another, example from uh, yeah, reality is uh, the world's first bunkering with renewable SNG. It was done last September in Bealte, uh, <coughs> sorry, in Brunsbüttel um, on the vessel called El Blue, or the former name was West Amelie. Um, in um, Bealte in Lower Saxony, there's a biogas plant um, you can see in the top where we get, have yeah, green CO2 from the biogas production. Um, there's as well an electrolyzer and a methanation system from uh, MIN built by MIN in Deggendorf. And uh, here uh, synthetic uh, natural gas is produced. Um, of course, it's quite small scale. The electrolyzer has a power of six megawatt. And um, then we Filled up a truck with completely green uh, methane, uh, brought it to Brunsbüttel, and um, yeah, well, uh, we have been bunkering then the Elb Blue uh, with this uh, completely CO2 neutral CO2. Um, for one round trip, um, this vessel needs around 120 tons of LNG, and uh, 20 tons of this LNG have been made 
uh, out of synthetic uh, climate neutral production. So to have a short summary, um, the alternative fuel selection is not obvious, uh, but where we see at the moment um, a high momentum towards uh, methanol due to lower capex and uh, good bunkering uh, possibilities. The technology will not be the bottleneck, so the technology is there. We can build windmills and solar parks. We can produce hydrogen. We can make uh, reactors to produce uh, the green fuels and uh, then later on the engines to burn it. Natural gas is already available now. Um, it can be a very positive uh, path we're, uh, via a gradual transition with drop-in or uh, bio and uh, e-SNG. Another promising fuel is ammonia. Uh, I personally uh, see ammonia in the long term. First, there need to be uh, uh, some things like toxicity and so on, bunkering need to be clarified. Especially important is a consistent regulation. I think this is one of the main points uh, which is missing at the moment. This is the uncertainty regarding the regulation. So it would be good to have here an ambitious and stringent uh, reduction path to uh, what the future fuels. And uh, yeah, we are ready. And thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Ludico. Um, so um, maybe two, two short additional questions. Um, so would you say then, that from a technical point of view, as a technology provider uh, yeah. for, sh for ships, for example, uh, and of course we know that ships usually are running very long um, uh, in their in their existence. Is it is the availability of multiple e-fuel options an advantage or a disadvantage for the shipping industry? Because you, I mean, I understand that one would like to know what is that technology, but on the other hand, that can be also a advantage through competition. There, what is your take here? So, yeah, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, if you have one solution, uh, then it's easier uh, to calculate your investments because you only need to go in one direction and then you can say, okay, for example, methanol, it's uh, the final thing and all our research and development and all the infrastructure investments are going into this one fuel. But uh, this is not the case. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult, of course, uh, where to put your eggs in, because it's not only now that we need to develop one methanol burning engine, but as well one for ammonia and another one for LNG. And um, so uh, this makes it, uh, yeah, of course, more, more difficult. And then we have uh, different voices in the market. Um, at the moment, uh, the loudest one is for sure in uh, the direction of methanol. But uh, others are saying, yeah, methanol is only a mid-term solution. In the long term, we need something which is carbon-free. This would be ammonia, but ammonia has some other challenges. <laughs> so for us as a company, of course, it would be very uh, yeah, a lot easier um, to have one solution where we can put uh, all our money in to invest the perfect solutions. But uh, the situation is like it is, and we need to see uh, all the ways in the different uh, scenarios and uh, yeah, be there as well. Okay, and then uh, one question from Wutko Schreuer. He, is, uh, he has uh, asked the question in the chat, considering methanol as preferred fuel, why not plain hydrogen as it would require less steps to make and therefore less energy loss, uh, low production cost and so on and so forth. So why not using hydrogen directly? Yeah, that's only on the first few, um, in shipping at least, uh, a good choice. Um, the capex uh, for hydrogen on the vessel are quite high um, because you need uh, quite big tanks to store the same energy uh, as hydrogen uh, compared to diesel or methanol. So you need really huge, um, these uh, cylindrical tanks, they are quite expensive. You have a big loss then in uh, cargo volume because when you need a bigger tank, it's maybe three, four times bigger than an LNG tank to store the same energy with hydrogen. Uh, so you have a loss in, in, in cargo, which means uh, the owner or the operator of the vessel, he has uh, less income. And then on the other hand, uh, hydrogen, um, it's correct when you uh, produce it as a gas, it's more simple, but you cannot bring it as a gas to the vessel. 
and you need to cool it down and liquefy it uh, to minus 252 degrees. And therefore you need energy and you need a lot of energy. And um, then this advantage is gone as well. So we are, for the big ocean going vessels where we are looking in, um, we have zero projects uh, with uh, pure hydrogen. So everyone is looking in this, uh, yeah, very red. Very interesting. Thank you very much so far. Um, there will be one or two questions at the end, um, but um, uh, we should move on to um, uh, actually cruise uh, ships now, because yeah. as we know, uh, there's, there are a lot of different use cases and the, the, maybe more known uh, as people going on cruises uh, are the cruise ships. And we're, we are very happy to have Martin Griffith uh, with us in the call. Um, uh, Martin is the director of public affairs of Cruise Lines Inter of the Cruise Lines International Association Europe, uh, which represents the European branch of the Cruise Lines International Association (CLIA), which is the world association of the cruise industry. So that's a real global uh, uh, organization. Uh, he is uh, a specialist in sustainability as well as crisis management with many years of experience in public affairs uh, for different sectors uh, and has personally a background in management studies and media and public relations. So um, what's the take uh, uh, on this whole subject uh, from the perspective of the cruise uh, industry? Martin, please. Good afternoon and thank you for inviting us to take part in this seminar. Some people might wonder why we're here, but we're a very small part of the maritime sector, less than 1% of the maritime industry. CLEAR itself represents 57 different member companies with just under 300 cruise ships operating globally, which is about 95% of the global cruise capacity. So whilst we're very small, we're very influential as an industry sector. I think it's also very important for the cruise industry that whilst we're only less than 1% of the industry, we actually have a disproportionately high uh, carbon emission rate. And if we act and act very quickly, we can make a big difference for the maritime sector and help the entire maritime sector improve quickly. The first thing I would say is that we are taking this very seriously, the whole EU Green Deal and the move to carbon neutrality. And we've just been through a very big exercise with our supply chain, looking at how we get to zero, net zero carbon. And we identified six clear pathways the first one was using pure hydrogen as a fuel, which has been discounted because of the low density and low energy efficiency. The second one was using ammonia, as we just heard, it has the toxicity issues and we don't think our passengers would like to walk around with a gas mask on the ship all day long. And then thirdly was the nuclear element, which today is not necessarily the right way, but it could be part of that in the future. The remaining three pathways that we've identified to help us get to carbon neutrality all include e-fuels. So we are totally committed to the development and the use of e-fuels moving forward. But as we've heard from many of the other speakers, we really have two options today. Currently, the cruise fleet is the youngest it's ever been. The average age of a cruise ship at the moment is less than 14.1 years. But we still only have two major technologies we can use on those ships, either LNG or liquid-based oil fossil fuels. We still, even the ships that are being ordered up until 27, 2027, we still don't have new technologies to change that. Yes, we make lots of uh, innovations in reducing our uh, efficiency by, you know, hull lubrications, hull coatings, changing lighting systems. Uh, some of our ships are operating at 12% more efficiency than they were designed in the shipyards to operate at. But we've got almost as far as we can go on board the ship today. So the next step that we really have to use is how do we develop the cleaner, greener fuels and how do we use them? We are already on the, the, the way. Uh, our cruise lines are actively using uh, biofuels from non-food or feed-based uh, biofuels. That sees a, a certain level of retrofitting on the ship. It's working, it's dropping fuels. We're seeing it happen. It's growing all the time. So we expect that to be the next step. And then we see the step after that is to move to e-methane or e-methanol based fuels uh, to replace LNG and oils in the future. What we also would like to see is that, you know, most of our ships during April to October are in Europe. So we're very committed to working with European authorities to make a greener maritime fleet. 
and we're following the EU Green Deal very closely. And we would like to see the revenues that are generated from the ETS system put into a maritime innovation fund where we can use that money to help us scale up e-fuel development and distribution, increase the infrastructure. As we've heard, there are some fuels that the infrastructure is almost there already. We just need the fuel to put through it. And also to help us either with subsidies or contracts, the difference to make them viable for the shipping sector to use. And we will continue to work on that. So I think that's all I'd like to say right now. We see e-fuels as part of our solution. We expect 50 to 70% of our fuels in the future to be from that. Uh, stream. So we're totally committed to work with the Alliance and the industry to get that going. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, maybe one follow-up question right away on, on the, the, the issue of costs, because um, uh, I mean, the cruise industry um, is, of course, seen as in the first place as a, a leisure uh, industry. Um, so one, one could say, okay, uh, Cost, fuel cost shouldn't be a huge problem here because um, uh, if people go on leisure cruise arts, they can pay for it. So it shouldn't be a problem to overburden, so to speak, those pro those costs uh, to uh, your customers. Uh, uh, how is how is your take on that, um, uh, and, and how is actually the situation here? Uh, I think if we take the, the discussion from t &E earlier on, the cruise sector is slightly different because of the hotel operations that we have on board the ship. So our fuel intensity or use is much higher than from a cargo ship. So we use a higher volume of, of fuel. But yes, it, as you say, we can pass on a certain amount of the cost to our passengers, but also we would like support to help us to change the new fuels without that burden being put directly on our passengers. Okay through um, subsidies as we see in holland at the moment where biofuels are being heavily subsidized they're being used very much in rotterdam we're seeing several of our cruise lines doing trials there now because it's 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 cost effective for them to, to make that switch um so so you would like to see uh, subsidize the fuel or or the uh, or the cruise lines itself using that fuel or it doesn't matter I think for us, we would like to see the, the, the fuel and the cost that we would buy it and use it because we're committed to move in that direction. Okay, understood. Um, uh, all right. Um, uh, then maybe a last question uh, on the, you, you referred on the emission trading system and the uh, inclusion of the shipping sector here. Um, what about the, uh, the fuel EU maritime regulation? Are you in favor for an additional sub quota uh, for e fuels as well? I think in principle, we, we, we are in favour. We feel that the maritime sector is being a bit left behind compared, compared to other transport sectors. And we, we have concern that we won't have availability to certain fuels if we don't have quotas clearly mandated. So we, in principle, we would support it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so um, we, thank you very much, actually, to all speakers so far. Um, uh, we had, I think, a very interesting round of um, uh, expertise uh, in our call. We have some questions uh, left, um, and I would suggest we go one, we do one final round of questions uh, to work on what uh, you you uh, put through. And uh, if you have more questions, please, from the audience, now is the time to put them into the FMA uh, uh, segment. Um, uh, maybe I, I should start with one question, which which was directed to uh, Mr. Ba Batista from the European Commission. Um, uh, uh, I just I just read it out uh, for an A plus for regulatory. Uh, he said fuel. You said fuel cells are the main powertrain option. Currently, all OEMs are developing combustion engines for e fuels. Why does you? Why do you? not include internal combustion engines here, especially for marine requirements. Fuel cell is not robust enough in uh, the next 10 years. Thank you. Thank you for In fact, I, uh, I had the fuel cells uh, in that slide as an enabler, uh, but it's true that uh, other energy conversion systems, in particular internal combustion engines, are developing multi-fuel uh, solutions, which are, uh, of, of course, uh, the, the improved and I, I would say the best 
specific power solution to to ensure that um, yeah to, that e fuels will be used uh, um, totally. So in fact, uh, yes, I would like to thank for the question and for the point, and I think it's a good addition definitely to the presentation that it should be included. Um, I, I take the opportunity to say that uh, in the context of this question, um, especially for existing ships, uh, the the inclusion or the promotion of a subquota of a mandate for e-fuels. Um, and we have listened a lot about ammonia, methanol, we have listened about even methane and e-methane, and I think this would be all uh, options that certainly in the future will, will thrive in maritime. But we look at the fuel EU maritime that will come into force in 2025. We will have ships operating, some of them only for a few years at the time that will have a service life of 25, 30 years and it will be uh, operating for a long period. Uh, we must acknowledge that the, the power, the, the fuel systems that are currently on board these ships are uh, traditional fuel systems, uh, fuel oil based. We need to consider that uh, when we have a sub quota for uh, e-fuels, we will uh, basically bring to this large, large part of the sector the the, the message that you will need to blend in uh, mm -hmm. an e-fuel. And therefore, we will struggle with uh, e-ammonia, e-methanol, and uh, e-methane, which will not blend in easily on a diesel-based uh, fuel. These operators will be cornered with e-diesel, uh, which... Uh, is going to be very, very, very expensive, and um, and will give uh, for sure uh, a potential uh, struggle and bottleneck for for these operators. And I, I I underline, will be the large large majority, even in 2030. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Ricardo. But just one one follow up question on that is that. Is that really true? Because as I recall, a, a pooling is allowed also in this regulation, right? So, um, what was the question? Uh, pooling, you can also pooling. So, uh, yeah. you, uh, so, so that then that's not a problem, right? It depends on uh, whether the existing ships available with systems which can take uh, e-fuels will be sufficient for the pooling. And don't forget that pooling is on the initiative of the operators. So the pooling is not uh, um, an architecture of the regulator. The pooling will be an architecture of the operators. So they will pool in accordance with the agreement between different companies or within the same company. And I believe that in general, uh, the, the and, and this goes back really to the question on the energy conversion system. Uh, in fact, the e-fuels will allow for great flexibility. And uh, there will be a variety of blending options operating with e-fuels. And we are talking about uh, percentages, which in terms of greenhouse gas intensity reduction in the fuel EU, will allow for a scalability through time of e-fuel production and availability in the market. Uh, and I think that this, what I pointed as a bottleneck, Maybe bottleneck is not the right word, I would say a challenge, but I think that e-fuels will in any way penetrate into this because ships will eventually be able to uh, segregate uh, fuel systems on board and have, for instance, an auxiliary system operating in one fuel whilst the main propulsion system will operate on another fuel and therefore compliance can be achieved in a variety of different options. And I believe that the sub-target or sub-quota is not a problem. I, I believe it will be an important element that we need to take into account. And I think it will uh, it will work. Uh, this bottleneck I mentioned is, in fact, something that we just need to be mindful uh, of. And uh, as you said, uh, Ralph, uh, pooling is definitely one of the flexibility uh, measures that is this, it's already in the regulation. And I think it will be also used also for the uh, sub quota or sub target on uh, on e fuels, and I think that's that's also an important point you had. All right, thank you very thank much. You. Maybe maybe Benoit, you can you can later on after uh, um, can also say something about that. What is your opinion about that? 
Um, uh, we have some questions still pending on the, uh, and I will pass that now to Rolf, uh, Rolf Stiefel, uh, uh, because of course we are talking uh, European regulation right now, but uh, at the end of the day, it's about the global uh, uh, decarbonization of the, of the sector. One question is, uh, how do we uh, actually come to global uh, solutions here? Maybe Rolf, you could, uh, could uh, uh, refer a little bit to that. And in addition to that, I would like to ask you, of course, the question about these one or two thousand uh, euros uh, per uh, per ton. Uh, so, uh, is that uh, somewhat feasible for uh, the shipping industry, or what's the solution there, Ross? Please. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ross, for uh, for the question. I mean, uh, a global regulation. Uh, I think. Uh, 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 there is a good and a bad when you look at, uh, at the shipping industry. Uh, the bad is, it's, yes, it's a very global uh, industry and uh, uh, the players based in Europe are competing with players uh, based in Singapore or based in Japan or based in, uh, in, in China in terms of uh, offering uh, transport solutions to, uh, to, to the customers. So from that point of view, it, it, it makes it difficult. But the benefit or the good thing of the shipping is it's, it's basically almost the only industry which is globally regulated through the IMO. So uh, the IMO is, is a, uh, uh, a, a, a suitable organization to enable regulation. And we have seen it uh, when it comes to the global sulfur cap introduction, the MAPOL regulation, solar safety of life at sea regulation, which has impacted in a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, change of the industry in terms of the relevant uh, regulations globally unified. And uh, the same can be applied now for these uh, uh, climate, uh, climate issue and the greenhouse gas uh, reduction. Nevertheless, we also know that the targets which the IMO has been published was uh, to half the uh, CO2 emission or greenhouse gas emissions by uh, 50 or to half them until 2050, whereas the greater society is asking for actually uh, to be carbon neutral by 2050. So there is a discrepancy in the targets which have been uh, uh, coming up uh, in the IMO uh, today and what uh, uh, the, the greater society is expecting and what we need if we look at uh, uh, Paris, one, uh, Paris uh, climate uh, agreement. So from that point of view, uh, uh, it has to be turned more here, the targets. There is a big... Uh, uh, effort here, and I think also politics uh, of the EU plays a, a, a big role. I mean, uh, who, who is regulating or sitting in IMO? It's the countries. So it is actually the political representatives of, uh, of the EU, as well as all the EU member states. And uh, 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 still, the global fleet, if you look at the ownership of the global fleet, Europe is making more than 50% of the global ownership uh, of uh, uh, the, the big uh, uh, shipping fleet. So there is a possibility to going forward now in the coming years to, to increase those targets and to come to a global regulation. And uh, having a European regulation might help to, uh, to also accelerate and to demonstrate that the regulation is possible also uh, for the maritime industry. So that, that uh, for this part of the question, then these 2000, uh, 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 euro was it okay? It doesn't matter, euro, US dollar, right? Now dollar, yeah. it's, <laughs> that's the same uh, today. Uh, it's uh, it's a rather interesting uh, price tag, uh, pretty pretty high on one hand, but uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, uh, fuel prices uh, have been going up and down in, in the history many many times. They have been doubling, they have been uh, tripling even, and. and going back to, to, to a lower, lower level with the, the global oil industry. So from that point of view, for, uh, for a lot of players in the industry, uh, that will be possible. Because also uh, looking into what we discussed with this uh, blending in option and with these quotas, we are not talking about 100% of the fuel, but we are talking about 6%, 10%, 15 20 25% of the fuel amount. Uh, according to uh, uh, the, 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 the years to come. And uh, subsequently, I, I think Benoit can confirm most likely also the industry will, uh, 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 for e-fuels, will strive and will, uh, will have an economy of scale and uh, developing technology and uh, the cost will come down. I mean, if you look at the, the batteries in cars, uh, how they came down in cost, uh, 
I assume then in uh, e fuel it should be at least double that speed. So from that point of view, uh, there's also a chance that those costs, uh, considering that we might not even produce them in Europe, but we might produce them in, uh, in where solar power or uh, wind power is much, much cheaper than in our uh, region here, uh, it, becomes, uh, it becomes much more viable to cost and they will come down. Uh, do you agree, Benoit? And maybe also some some uh, answers also to Ricardo on that. Um, no, so for, for, for the cost, I'm uh, I think as I said, it would depend also on the regulation, um, what type of electricity you can use, what type of CO2. This gives the first reference, and then there is a gap for distribution to be done in terms of premium between uh, uh, the conventional fuel on one side and the alternatives, and I think that. Um, in, in, in the sector, and I, uh, I, I guess that uh, I will turn to, to the sector to confirm that, but um, you, th there will be two things that you will buy. You will buy on one side the fuel, so the energy service, and you will buy on the other side the decarbonation, so the, the, the environmental service of e-fuels compared to conventional fuel. And so at the end of the day, uh, uh, you need to compare the different options that are allowed by the regulation in terms of cost per tons of CO2 avoided. And, and this will provide a competitive landscape between the different fuels that we mentioned, and that will change uh, a long time. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the first thing. Second, in terms of differential, obviously, um, uh, the regulation more or less um, define uh, how you distribute the premium between uh, us, the producer, our customer, and the customer of our customer. And if you have a sub quotas, you have a part of the differential that is already passed to the final user. So this also provides or, or kind of clarify the, the energy, uh, sorry, the economic equation. Um, and last but not least, obviously, uh, the costs are expecting to decrease. And as it was mentioned by Rolf, um, it can provide as well an ability to edge compared to existing price that are more or less uh, the fossil price of so the, the oil. I, I come from the oil and gas industry originally. And you can provide as well um, uh, somehow a flexibility, uh, sorry, a visibility and a stability of prices. Because if I have a PPA on, on, on electricity supply, that is my primary cost driver, I can provide my customer long term uh, visibility on a pretty fixed price. So this is also a, a part of the discussion we have. Uh, and it might, for the first project, one of the points is you need to find a good way uh, between the length, the duration that is expected from the customer for our project to be bankable. So for our project to be financeable with private finance, so you need to have um, an offtake long enough to make it financeable. And as at the same time, uh, it's pretty new to have a very long term uh, commitment with regards to uh, fuel uh, in, in, in that area. So that's also an important point to, to keep in mind. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, um, Ricardo, short word on costs. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. We, uh, costs in the, in the sub-target. Uh, we, 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 we were slightly worried about how the, the um, about how much we can really hope uh, e-fuels to uh, become cheaper in the future if there is a fixed demand inscribed in a regulation. Uh, so this is um, a comment and uh, at the same time maybe a, a, a question to, to the, the colleague panelists as well on how um, whether they perceive this risk or whether this is an unfounded uh, concern. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Rudiger, that's maybe a question you could, uh, you could answer in your final. Can you please uh, repeat? I didn't understand it. Yeah, uh, how the sub target or how the sub quota for e fuels uh, would uh, allow us to hope that in the future uh, the price or the cost of uh, e fuels will come down? Because if we have a demand fixed in a regulation, yeah. uh, our concerns that um, there will be no real incentive for the for the price to become um, to become cheaper for these fuels. Where do you go? Yeah, um, yeah. This is, I think quite difficult to answer. Um, 
I think that the, the target should be in the first to decarbonize shipping and uh, therefore these uh, uh, quotas uh, and the share of, of issues I see as a, a yeah, good first step. And then there will be for sure competition in the market. Uh, and there are several uh, producers uh, of electrolyzer, of uh, reactors, and, and uh, all uh, in this uh, yeah, production and supply chain for e-fuels. And there will be for sure a natural competition. And then the lowest prices will win. So I think this will come automatically. And okay. uh, the bigger, yeah, and yeah, the, bigger the market, and uh, yeah, um, the bigger the market and uh, the bigger the scalability, uh, the more the price will come down, usually. In I mean, clearly the problem might be that we do not have scale effects uh, in place right now since we are no, no. industrialized production, right? But uh, please tell me, uh, hmm. also you have your final thoughts and maybe you can add something on that on behalf of the team. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to to come again on the the idea that the subquota would actually incentivize for ELNG or emission. But first of all, uh, the original originally the idea of the six percent of e-fuels came uh, from a study from Transport and Environment, and I don't think that we would have proposed such data uh, to promote uh, synthetic methane. Now, uh, the study was based on a fleet turnover. So this was all about new ships and a way to uh, make sure that there are early deployments of uh, green ammonia, green methanol ships, uh, so that uh, by 2030, we reach already a substantial share uh, of uh, green e-fuels, and then we can have a scale up. Uh, and furthermore, uh, so to incentivize for these early deployments of new ships, uh, we think that we could use uh, the ETS revenues, and uh, we've just calculated that by using just half of ETS revenues for shipping, we could actually finance all of Europe's uh, container ships running on green ammonia. So that's quite significant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, since we are actually uh, on the final minutes uh, of this event, I would uh, finally pass over the word to Martin again, if he has to add something uh, uh, as uh, final remarks from his side. No, I think I would just like to echo the point that TNA just made. If we get the revenue from the ETS back into our industry to help us change quickly, it will change quickly. And I think that's a really important uh, message for us to support us to, to change fuels. Great. Thank you very much. So there's uh, two more questions in the in the chat, which I would which are uh, related to Rudiger. Uh, I think maybe he could answer that via typing in the chat. Um, and uh, uh, with that, uh, we have uh, reached our uh, the ending point of this panel discussion. Um, I thank you all very much for uh, for the discussion and especially also for for the questions from the audience. And since we do this event together, as we stated before with the Maritime Platform, I will introduce now Tessa Odewald, who is the Managing Director of the, Managing, uh, of the Maritime Platform, sorry, uh, for some closing remarks uh, uh, and uh, maybe also a short uh, summary on what we just heard. And with that, I pass over to Tessa, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, in, in conclusion, and as a, rough, as a summary of the various contributions today, I would like to stress the following. Global shipping is indeed the backbone of the world economy, transporting between 80 and 90% of global freight, but is also responsible for about 3% of global CO2 emissions, as we heard today. A carbon-free and therefore a climate-neutral shipping sector contributes not only to reaching climate protection goals, but also to economic growth, innovation, and global prosperity. Alternative fuels play a central role in decarbonizing shipping, including e-fuels. The maritime industry will see a mix of alternative fuels, with fuel choices depending on the type of vessel, its use, its operational profile, as well as the availability of fuel and bunkering infrastructure. For example, we have heard today that Maersk again has decided for methanol-fueled container vessels, but also of first cases of an SNG, 
so that's synthetic LNG being used on the German West Coast. Also, it was made clear today that the cruise shipping sector will heavily, heavily rely on e-fuels in the future. So we will necessarily find ourselves in a multi-fuel world, and we need to ensure that we develop framework conditions to allow for this development, including legislation that reflect the need for developing a market for e-fuels in the maritime sector. Today, we have looked at the rule of e-fuels in shipping, necessary developments in regulatory frameworks and technical developments, also with a view to maintaining a globally competitive European shipping sector. We had some very clear statements today, notably from politicians. For example, the EU needs to be an early adopter of e-fuels and that sub-quotas are, and I quote, the most straightforward way to increase production and use. Also, that the EU needs to send, and I'll quote again, a very clear signal to COP27. We also heard clear statements of the need for e-fuels for both shipping and aviation, and very much in line with the e-fuel alliance and the maritime platform, a clear and only focus on green e-fuels based on renewable energy and green hydrogen. We heard about necessary efforts to maintain the global competitiveness of our European shipping sector by, for example, pushing for the development of an international certification scheme for alternative fuels. The special challenges of the shipping sector were highlighted. The need to decarbonize existing vessels, as well as the high level of uncertainty, which is especially damaging to the shipping sector, given is its investment cycles of up to 25 and up to 25, 30 years. We've heard about the role of e-fuels in terms of their blend-in capability. They can be used in, in, in existing combustion engines on ships. And we heard the suggestion of drop-in quotas for shipping to increase their sustainability. So challenges, yes, but also some good news, especially as we are facing a cost of living crisis. And ambitious targets to decarbonize shipping would only add minimally to the cost for the end producer. So those trainers shipped in from, in from Asia would only cost a few cents more to all of us. Overall, we have repeatedly heard that we need to create long-term planning and investment decision to create long-term planning and investment, um, uh, a, a long-term framework for the shipping sector and as a supply producer side, which will crucially enhance the market development for e-fuels and shipping. Today, it has become clear that the EU in general and uh, the fuel EU maritime legislation in particular can and should play a leading role here. With this, and on behalf of both the maritime platform and the e-fuel alliance, I would like to thank everyone who contributed to today's event from both the political sphere and the maritime sector. I would also like to say a big thank you to the organizing team at both the eFuel Alliance and Palmidas, and especially Marlene, who among other things was also on standby when my very own IT equipment decided to call it a day just yesterday. And to all of you, many thanks for attending and let's work together to create a sustainable, an ultimately carbon-free shipping sector emerging in a multi-fuel world. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon, everyone.